children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, the trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects in him who is the head, even Christ. Let me see if I can minimize this over here real quick. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Mark 12, 29 through 31, like we mentioned last week. Uh, really, when we think about it, the you know, by far the best way to love our neighbors as ourselves is to encourage them to obey the gospel. Uh, anything we do uh, that doesn't encourage them to obey the gospel, that, that really, we're really missing an opportunity. And we talked about how even the longest physical life on earth is zero compared to eternity. And, and that's a true statement. And so uh, we, we definitely want to, you know, again, be nice to our neighbors, help them with their physical needs when we can. Uh, but we've really got to keep in mind that uh, the way we can just do them infinitely more good is if we encourage them to obey the gospel and, again, lead, lead them to the truth. Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, uh, just a quick review. Uh, you know, what we talked about uh, last week. Made, I uh, just want to talk about uh, uh, five points. And if, uh, if someone could grab the doors back there, they're fantastic singers, but it's, it's uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead and shut those. That'd be, uh, that'd be great. Um, so the first point uh, that we made was that, uh, you know, God created time and therefore he's outside of time. Now, the reason that was important, I think we gave two reasons. One was uh, that's, that's basically just a question that almost everybody will ask at some point. In other words, uh, when they first start thinking about the subject and we tell them that God created the universe, well, the first thing they'll often come back with is, well, if God created the universe, you know, who created God? Who made God? Uh, first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means God not only created the heavens and the earth, he also created time. To create time, he has to be outside of time. And being outside of time, by definition, he can't have a beginning or an end. And so again, just, just in a quick review, so by definition, God cannot have a beginning or an end because he's outside the dimension of time. So that's the first reason it answers that question. But the second one is, is what you start pointing out is every uh, religion, uh, you know, Big Bang, you know, pick on from time to time. Uh, but, you know, the Big Bang, it, it has a supernatural origin. And they don't like to say that, but uh, when you start talking about uh, points of infinite density where the laws of nature don't apply, well, laws of nature don't apply. That's supernatural. So that's one explanation. That was probably like 10 years ago. What started the Big Bang? Uh, now we're into uh, uh, outside the observable universe, another outside of nature, supernatural. Uh, there's supposedly this big universe generator that's just spitting out, you know, infinite number of universes. And so that's, again, it's just an appeal to a false god. It's an appeal to the supernatural. So that's, that's an important point because it distinguishes the Bible from these false religions associated with origins. And so that's... Uh, so that could be one point. And then the, the immediate follow on is, you know, we talked about the fact that we can choose tells us how we should choose. And what we meant by that was if we were just chemicals, if God had not given us a spirit, we could not even make a simple choice because at a fundamental level, we would just be a very sophisticated chemical reaction. If all we were was a very sophisticated chemical reaction, then Literally, no free will whatsoever. This is one that atheists freely admit. They don't like talking about it. Um, but that's an implication of atheism is by us not having a spirit. We're just a chemical reaction. In other words, literally no free will whatsoever down to you know, whether you got a glass of water before you came here tonight, where you sat, uh, nothing. And so, um, so I like to think that number two ties back into number one. Because I know I have free will. I know I can make choices. I just did this with the pointer. It's kind of random. I chose to do that. Uh, and so the, the whole point is, uh, I know I can make choices. And so that also resolves question number one. Well, why would you believe in the God of the Bible rather than believing in a universe generator or believing in this point of infinite density? Well, one of the reasons, many, many, many reasons, one of them is just I know I have free will. That universe generator doesn't give me free will. And so, so you, you start piecing it all together. And so when we're talking about the reasonableness of Scripture, and you look at the big picture, find out not only is scripture reasonable, uh, it's, it's very clear that it's God's inerrant word, but it's just you know, piecing everything together, just looking at all of the different evidence that God has given us. Uh, third one we mentioned then is every now and then someone will get, uh, and I almost want to call it like brainwashed, and, and please, uh, 
uh, whenever I talk like this, you know, I, I was an evolutionist until I was, I don't know, uh, you know, junior, senior year in undergrad. And so, so whenever I say, you know, people are deceived or people aren't thinking, or well, I'm talking about myself too. So it's not, you know, just, uh, you know, sometimes I'm talking fast. So please don't take this, this isn't talking down to anybody. There's some really, really smart people out there that are really, really deceived. And so one of the questions you can ask them, sometimes people will say, well, you know, I, I gave up on God, I gave up on Christianity, I'm, I really trust in science now. And so one of the things we'll talk about, we talked about last week, we'll talk about some more tonight is, is true science is the Christian's friend. I mean, true science is always consistent with the Bible, and, and it's really the enemy of the evolutionist and the atheist. But that's not the way it's presented to the world. And so, you know, if someone says, well, no, I, I, I believe in science, you know, I trust in science. Well, you just say, okay, well, is it scientific to believe that life just made itself? And the first, you don't want to hear the yes coming out of them until they think about it a second. And you start, they start realizing, well, wait a second, you know, we can't make life. Hundreds of billions of dollars, smartest PhDs, incredibly sophisticated labs, we can't make life. You know, we make computers, we make cars, we make airplanes, we make space shuttles. God's given us the ability, the creativity, and the intelligence to make all kinds of things. We can't make life. So is it really scientific to say something that we've spent that much money, that much effort on, and can't figure out is it scientific to teach as fact that it just happened randomly? Well, in reality, that goes against everything we know about science. You know, it, it basically violates, you know, fundamental law of science. And so, uh, and so again, it's, uh, but it's just to get people to start thinking. Uh, fourth one we pointed on, uh, this was a little tricky. Remember we did the car analogy about randomly mutating the manual for, for making the perfect automobile? Well, that's, uh, you, know, you start thinking about the diversity of life. It takes a little more discussion. But boy, Genesis 1 and 2 is exactly consistent with what we're seeing. I mean, from studying uh, why chromosomes, mitochondrial DNA, it's, you know, we all came from a single man and a single woman. Now the point comes down to, well, when was it? You know, and some people say, oh, well, you know, you can look at this and this and this and this way, and it's uh, 50,000 years ago, so that's, that's, you know, inconsistent. Well, you know, they're down to trying to say when that occurred to try to disprove Adam and Eve. Scientifically, from studying, again, uh, mitochondrial DNA, why chromosome, we came from a single man and a single woman, completely consistent with the Bible. Now, if you look at it correctly, and there's a book I didn't bring, it's just starting to, it's a, um, again, a Harvard PhD studies genetics. He's, he's saying that, uh, uh, that measured mutation rates is actually very consistent with that happening about 6,000 years ago. So again, there's a lot of debate there. Uh, not really debate, it's just discussion. Uh, but the whole point is the diversity of life we see on earth is completely consistent with God making original created kinds uh, with tremendous amount of genetic information in those kinds. And then everything we see around us today uh, just resulting from um, you know, mutations, natural selection, uh, other factors, just you know, certain animals migrating to certain areas that had a certain you know, a subset of the original uh, genome. All very consistent what we see today with what we read in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think you remember, we, we finished up with just some of the atrocities that have been committed uh, in the name of, uh, you know, a lot of them were not really in the name of evolution, but evolution gave them the scientific excuse. And of course, you know, World War II, Adolf Hitler, that's the, the, the obvious example, you know, where he was trying to develop the master race and he talked about, you know, he didn't want to go against, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years of nature, you, you, you know, you know, trying to evolve. So, so, but, but you just think of abortion and you think of the arguments made from abortion, you think about uh, eugenics, you think of racism. Uh, well, all of those arguments that really, I, I don't want to make this, uh, want to keep this at the right level. It's really because people start focusing on the physical and not the spiritual. And of course, the Bible, Scripture makes it clear uh, that we need to focus on the spiritual and not the physical. And so when we're talking about the reasonableness of Scripture, that's to me is a very obvious one because our tendency can be to just focus on the physical. Scripture makes it clear, no, we need to focus on the spiritual. We look at what happens when people focus on the physical and it's, it's a, it, has, it can have horrible consequences. And so I mentioned that because that's something as Christians that we're gonna have to continually just, it's a big um, philosophical shift, but we've gotta do everything we can to keep uh, the US, keep the world focused on the spiritual and not the physical. And that's a challenge, but that's again, something that's very clear from scripture. So those were, uh, that's a review. And so all those, you know, I, I kind of view those as 
to me, and this is all opinion, that's why I said a lot of this is brainstorming, uh, to me those are ones that you could almost use to start a conversation with, or you could almost, you know, just almost in a casual conversation get on these types of topics. Now the next ones, the ones we'll be covering tonight, uh, they're important, and a lot of times people will have questions on these, but they might be a little more, uh, you know, after you, you get into a discussion with someone, or after you've determined, well, what's, what's, what are they struggling with? Why aren't they willing to objectively consider the Bible? You know, what, what is the, you know, what, what's, what are they really, you know, what, what are they really thinking? And so, uh, those topics, uh, go through the first two fairly quickly, of uh, vestigial organs and structures, homologous and analogous structures. Uh, some people talk about the flood. You know, we have tremendous evidence for the flood, and there is a, uh, a DVD back there, it's Is Genesis History. And so again, if, you, if you're interested, please sign up, you know, we can get you copies of that. Uh, it's, a, it's a really well done DVD. It was one of those ones that was released in theaters. Uh, I think it was the number one movie the night. It, was, it, was, it showed one night, it was like a Thursday night, but uh, uh, Julie and I, we were sitting on the, we were actually sitting by the exit, uh, you, you, know, you know, watching this movie, you, you know, because uh, they, they'd oversold the theater, which was fantastic. Uh, and so it's, uh, uh, but it's a really good DVD. It talks a lot about the uh, flood, but we'll, we'll talk about some of the evidences tonight. Uh, fossil record, uh, of course, again, very consistent with the biblical account. And then I'm not sure if we'll get to five, six, and seven, uh, but we'll, we'll see how far we get. And so at least touch on those uh, just in the, the time we have uh, remaining. And so, uh, so first one is a vestigial structure. So what that is, and this one was really popular maybe 20 years ago. It's starting to go away but you'll hear it every now and then. And what the idea was, uh, it was in 1895, there was a German scientist, uh, Wiedersheim, who said that uh, we had 180 organs and structures in our body that were completely useless. You know, they're just evolutionary leftovers. And so, uh, so he, he promoted this. And, uh, and so it kind of took route. These are, uh, this is a quote from, uh, uh, took some quotes from biology textbooks. And here, this was, uh, Define vestigial structure, a structure that is a remnant of an organism's evolutionary past and has no function from the Latin vestigia meaning footprint. Now, so again, you know, this whole idea, well, you know, no, no function whatsoever for these organs and structures. And now biblically, we realize that since, you know, we've got mutations, we've got death, there's certainly the functionality of certain organs and structures might have declined, you know, in the 6,000 years since Adam and Eve. Uh, but as far as the way that vestigial organs and structures is defining that statement. It's, it's you yeah, that, that those never existed. You know, it's, uh, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the punchline. Uh, of course, that was 1895. Uh, 108 years later, 2003, was when uh, there were dozens of papers published on the importance of the appendix for uh, when we're very young, when we're still uh, developing. And so that was the last holdout. So in other words, we found important functions for all 180 of those organs and structures, but it took us 108 years to do that. And so another point, you remember I mentioned uh, evolution, belief in atheism, evolution that, that does spiritual damage? Well, to me it also does physical damage because you wonder, well, why, why would it take 108 years for us to figure out the functions of all those organs and structures? Well, if someone was an anatomist, you know, so they're just fresh out of college, they just say, well, what am I gonna study? You know, what do I wanna dedicate my career to? Well, they're not going to realistically pick one of those organs or structures that all these famous scientists are saying, oh, those are just evolutionary leftovers, they don't do anything. And so to me, that was an example of how that could have actually been a, not just a spiritual setback, but also a, a physical setback. So this is, uh, uh, this is another quote, again, a often used a biology textbook, says, uh, vestigial structure is a body part that no longer has a function. Is a, how is a vestigial body part evidence of evolution? And so uh, this particular book, uh, it was really funny. It's, it's really almost scary when you see, especially what's in the teacher's editions. I mean, it spent probably uh, three pages uh, just in the, in the side notes explaining the teacher how to convince their students that they see all this evolution around them. And if you looked at what they were saying, it had absolutely nothing to do with evolution. You know, it was like what we talked about last week. It'd say like, well, if you go down to the pet store, you see a new breed of dog or cat. You know, that's evidence of evolution. Remember, it's actually the opposite of evolution because you've gotten rid of genetic information instead of gaining it. Uh, but I mean, it was, it was, it's almost ridiculous, almost like, uh, yeah, tell them to look at the clock on the wall and then explain to you why that's evidence for evolution. And so kind of an aside, but don't underestimate how brainwashed people can get in this particular area. And that's why when you say people are deceived, uh, there's, there's a reason for that. And so, and then this is evidence that was available at the 1925 Scopes trial, again, just given the uh, uh, you know, details on the vestigial structure. Now this was, uh, uh, again, as we said, we have found important functions for all 180 of those 
organ and structures once thought to be vestigial. I should also mention though, does anybody ever uh, heard the term uh, junk DNA? Remember that? Okay, well that was popular for maybe 10 years. It was completely debunked in 2012 and Hudson Alpha, one of the institutes in town here, uh, was actually very uh, uh, instrumental in that study. And that's when they just went and they looked through the, uh, yeah, they were studying DNA and they, uh, they basically concluded, no, all of our DNA does something. We just don't understand, we just don't understand it yet. And so again, it's not evidence for evolution. It was just, I'll, I'll say scientific ignorance. And that's, that's not saying that the scientists aren't smart. It's just, we didn't know. Uh, but where I say they were smart is they were smart enough to admit that they didn't know rather than pretending it didn't do anything. Uh, one explanation that's given to me is if you've, uh, you know, say, you know, going back to manuals for, you ever look at like a manual for a transmission? You know, and, and like how to put a transmission together? Well, you know, about the first this much is the parts list or this much. You know, so that's the list of parts. And the rest of the manual is how do you put them all together? You know, how do they fit? How do you make it? Well, uh, what we were saying was the only part of DNA that mattered was the parts list. And all of the DNA that says how everything goes together didn't matter. And that's how they came up with this term junk DNA. Now, I don't know if it was quite that horrible, but uh, if that's really what was being done, I mean, that's just, you know, again, that's being intentionally deceptive, you know, because obviously the parts are important, but how the parts go together is at least equally important. Um, okay, next topic, i uh, going to talk about our, uh, any, any questions on vestigial organs and structures, though, before we keep going? Okay, so that's one that'll come up. And so if you have just the one response is just, yeah, 1895, there were 180, you know, uh, organ structures called vestigial. Uh, those all went away by 2003, and now there's no such thing. That should satisfy the person, but they can go research it if they want to. Now, the next one, and this is one I'd say is probably the most popular, but a lot of times it's kind of, I'll, I'll say disguised, or it's kind of subtle. And this is homologous or analogous structures. And so the idea is, you know, say the uh, bones in my arm, if you look at them, uh, well, there's some similarities uh, bet between, the, say, the bones in my arm and the bones in the leg of a dog or any other animal has a bone, so, or muscles. And so you start seeing these similarities. And so the idea is that, well, because we see similarities, physical similarities uh, between life forms, so that must mean that you know, one type of life form turned into another, turned into another. And so to try to back up evolution. This. These are some, again, drawings you know, taken out of uh, you know, various textbooks. This is uh, the, uh, just some quotes. Uh, but what I'll point out is uh, the argument is religious, not scientific. And we'll talk about that a little more, but just think about it. Okay, yeah, someone can say, well, they see similarities, physical similarities in life. So that means one life turned into another, turned into, you know, one kind of animal turned into another, turned into another. Uh, but I can also look at it and say, well, uh, you know, those physical similarities, that's exactly what I expect because God created all life. And going back to what the Bible says, though, are only people are created in God's image. In other words, there's a, a huge spiritual difference between people and animals. Only people are created in God's image, but the physical similarities, you know, it's, uh, it's not unexpected because we had the same creator. So that's why it's a religious argument, but it's not just, uh, we're not the only ones that would notice this is a spiritual argument. This, is, this quote, this first one, okay, so this is Department of Zoology, University of British Columbia on their website. Okay, Department of Zoology, Zoology University of British Columbia. You think, well, okay, that's technical, you know, technical quote, must be a you know, very technical website. Well, here's their quote. This observation makes little sense for created objects since a creator could mix and match features observed in any organism. Okay, is that a scientific statement? I mean, there's not a piece of science in there. You know, what they're basically saying is, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to explain to us what, you know, how, what they think God would do or what's God character. So it's not, it's not a scientific statement. So, that's, so you get tip-offs when you start exploring this, when people start saying, oh, yeah, this could only make sense uh, you know, from an evolution standpoint, can't make sense uh, from a creation standpoint. Actually, you know, when we think about it, it makes better sense from a creation standpoint. Um, just because, for example, if you were driving here tonight and you turned on the radio and you heard a song you'd never heard before, but you said, oh, that must be a new song from whoever. Uh, well, how would you know that? I mean, how would you even guess at that? Well, it's, it's the similarities in the songs, right? You might, if you have a famous musician, you might say, well, they write songs that sound kind of like this. This new song sounds kind of like that. So you're guessing, okay, that's probably them. So it's the similarities. If you have an artist uh, that you like, you can probably recognize a painting from that artist based on certain similarities. You know, it can be everything from just the theme, what they chose to paint about, what colors they use. You know, 
I'm, I'm horrible at art, so I won't even try to throw out terms, but I'm just saying, you know, people can, can look at a painting and say, okay, that was probably painted with So again, whenever we see similarities, it's because we have this, uh, because it's the same creator. So all of our experiences, similarities, tend to mean you had the same creator. When we see physical similarities in life, that's exactly what we would expect. And so again, it's not, uh, but it's a religious argument. And so I'll just, uh, uh, but our experience would be, that's what we would expect given that God created all life. But again, the physical similarities aren't what's important. It's the fact that only people are created in God's image. Okay, so any thoughts or discussion on that one? Okay, because that's an important, the reason that's an important one is that's, uh, that's one, uh, it, it's a lot more subtle, but you'll see that a lot. A lot of people will say that's probably 50, over 50% 50 of the arguments made for evolution. I'll try to, try to you know, kind of just slide this one in. Well, we see similarities, so it must be evolution. But obviously the, the Bible's just, as, to me, it's a much better explanation for the similarities. Um, okay, now we're gonna talk about the, the global flood. And this is one uh, up until, I'll say up until Mount St. Helens. And again, I really encourage you, if you're at all interested, to, to go ahead and get, grab a copy of that DVD. Uh, it's uh, up until Mount St. Helens, we had, well, all these processes would take, you know, millions of years and, you know, all, all these reasons that uh, the flood couldn't be an explanation. Well, then Mount St. Helens happened. And I know, I used to remember Mount St. Helens as the, the mountain blowing up, but in conjunction with that, you ended up having a lot of floods, you know, a lot of everything from uh, snow melting right away and, you know, lakes forming and dams bursting. And so you had a lot of flooding events. And we were seeing all kinds of things happening, everything from strata being laid down rapidly to canyons being carved out of solid rock rapidly. We saw things happening in days that you know, a lot of people have been told would take millions of years. And so that actually got people thinking. And it was a very, very tiny flood, obviously, compared to the global flood, but it actually got people thinking. So then I uh, started looking at it. And so just briefly, I'll cover these topics. You had uh, fossil graveyards. You know, if a, uh, you've ever noticed if a river floods, you know, you drive certain times of the year, it's a, uh, is it the Flint River sometimes floods or, you know, a lot, a lot of rivers flood. Well, you ever notice that when they're flooding, uh, after the flood recedes, there's all this debris piled in certain areas. And, you know, a lot of times it's just because of the river current, you know, like a bend in the river. But you have all this debris in a certain area. And so when they talk about fossil graveyards, you can go hundreds of miles uh, without finding a fossil. And then all of a sudden the fossils are just thick. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, uh, Matthew and I were blessed. We got to go out to Wyoming to this fossil dig site. And it was literally, if you got to the right spot, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, you know, you know, where do you dig and how do you find something? It was literally, you know, dig here and you'll find a dinosaur bone. So we actually have a, a, a hadrosaur bone uh, in some obscure museum's basement somewhere named after us. So it's really cool. <laughs> you know, because again, it's a, but that was just a fossil graveyard because uh, all of those bones had all piled up. And so, you know, they're just um, amazingly thick there. You have uh, folded rock layers with no fractures. And so you think about it, um, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and forward to the folded rock layers real quick. So this is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and you see the, uh, you see that fold in the in the rock. And so, and, and some of these folds, they can be thousands of feet tall, but you have this, this rock's coming along and it bends, uh, and then it comes back out, it can make a complete S. You take that rock today, you can crumble it between your fingers. I mean, it's just completely brittle, uh, but there's no cracks in the fold. So you look at that fold and it's, it's just a smooth fold. And so uh, that rock either had to be laid down that way, or it had to be bent extremely soon after it was laid down, because if it hadn't, been bent, uh, it would have cracked when it, uh, when it uplifted. And then it's still a sedimentary rock. So it's not metamorphic rock. You can't say, well, it got hot, maybe that made it more ductile later on. Because if it had gotten hot, it wouldn't be sedimentary rock anymore. So, it's a, so again, it's, it sounds subtle, but when someone thinks about it, the flood is, is definitely the best explanation for that. Uh, the, uh, uh, you end up with uh, no weathering and erosion between uh, layers. And so, um, I think a way to think about that is, uh, well, Zert Road's getting, of course, totally developed right now, but a few years ago at the corner of, I think it was Zert and Martin, they started to put in that shopping center, and for whatever reason, they stopped. But they got to the point where they graded the land, it was all nice and smooth, it was all dirt, and, and then they stopped. Well, boy, within six months, I mean, there were plants growing all over the place, there was, you know, all stuff been digging in it, and, and you, you get, you guess what you would call just this erosional processes happening. You had little rivulets where it rained and the water would run off. And so, so that's what happens. You lay down 
a layer of anything, well, it's going to erode over days or weeks or months. So again, just from animals burrowing in it, uh, you know, insects, grubs, uh, plants growing in it, all, all these things that will erode it. Well, when we look at um, uh, these rock layers, like this is just at Mount St. Helens, uh, well, of course, those rock layers, they were laid down so fast that you notice there's no erosion between the layers. There's no erosion between the boundaries. Uh, but guess what? The Grand Canyon, it's the same thing. Uh, you can have rock layers that they'll say, oh, there was, uh, there's one, it's hundreds of millions of years between this layer and this layer. But there's no erosion. And so, and so again, it's very powerful evidence that no, it wasn't, those weren't laid down you know, years and years and years apart. They had to be laid down extremely rapidly to avoid having that, that type of erosion. So again, very consistent uh, with a global flood. The um, transcontinental rock layers, you have rock layers that go completely across continents. You even have, you can even trace rock layers going across the Atlantic. Again, very consistent with the global flood. Sand transported great distances. There's sand out in the southwest that the closest source we know of is the Appalachian Mountains. And so somehow that sand had to get transported from the Appalachian Mountains to the southwest. Again, very consistent with the flood. Marine fossils high above uh, sea level and abundance of fragile uh, shell fossils. So again, lots of evidence for the flood. Um, I'll go through this uh, very quickly. Uh, a few points wanting to make. Uh, Pre-flood world would be very different than the post-flood world because, again, the flood covered the entire Earth. And so just the, the difference, you know, just the, the geological activity, just the, the whole change in geography, um, you know, is just huge because of the flood. So when someone says, well, where's the Garden of Eden? Uh, the only answer is we don't know. Uh, and the reason we don't know is because, again, those, uh, those particular four rivers, you know, the spot described as the Garden of Eden, uh, it doesn't exist today. But that's exactly what we would expect because we know that was all, all of those um, features would have been destroyed during the flood because it was a, a catastrophic global flood. The, uh, so pre-flood world, very different from uh, the post-flood world. Again, extensive geologic changes. Uh, we do have evidence of a massive worldwide die-off of marine life at Genesis 7, 11. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. We have uh, osmium and shale oil, which is uh, volcanic activity, evidence fountains of the great deep. Uh, evidence, of obviously, the immersion of all land when you have marine fossils on top of uh, the highest mountaintops. The, uh, uh, this is uh, just some examples of fossil graveyards. Uh, and so, again, if someone's interested and you say, well, give me an example of a fossil graveyard, you have the Redwall Limestone, Green River Formation, Wyoming, Fossil Bluff, and Tasmania. Lots of examples of fossil graveyards. Uh, we talked about the Brent Strata, the uh, very well preserved fossils. And so, if you've uh, you ever uh, go on vacation and have like a goldfish die on you while you're gone? Well, you know, when you come back, uh, depending on how long your vacation is, you'll notice there's not a lot of fine detail left on the goldfish, okay? Because it'll, it'll decay very rapidly. That's just in a little goldfish tank. Well, uh, we've got fossils of soft-shelled creatures, in this case, it's trilobites. Uh, you, you can see like the, the compound lens of the eye. You see this incredible detail. So again, very consistent with that being buried quickly. Had to be buried and preserved very quickly, again, uh, uh, powerful evidence uh, for the flood. Uh, and then the flood is also a very, it's probably the best explanation for the ice age. And so just to mention why on that, if the earth just gets very cold, you don't get an ice age because it's too dry. Uh, in other words, there's not enough moisture. If the earth gets very warm, you have plenty of moisture, but it's too hot for there to be an ice age. But if you have a source of moisture, in this case it would be very warm oceans, and you have cold air over the land, in this case it would be, say, ash injected into the atmosphere from the fountains of the great deep, you can have cold air over the land and very warm oceans. Well, our climate models, for what they're worth, they predict you'll have an ice age. Uh, but what's interesting is none of, there's something like 60 secular theories to try to trigger an ice age, none of them work. Uh, you'll hear about the Milinkovitch theory, where supposedly the, just the tilt in certain planets and some of the distances, and maybe this causes slight perturbation, nowhere near enough to cause an ice age of the scale that we saw. And so, uh, so that's just some of the evidence that we have for the flood. Uh, so any, any questions? Anybody heard any objections to the flood that, that, you know, they just, that we should you know, talk about or, or uh, brainstorm on? Okay, so the, yeah, Lynn. Is there enough water 
in the surrounding earth in order to cover uh, right. the so, highest so, far where the, where the mountain's not as high as right. we think they are so, in Right. So, so right now, if, if the Earth was a perfect record, it's very consistent that the animals we see lowest in the fossil record could be uh, from habitats that were buried first. But then you also have animals that could flee uh, the rising floodwaters. You have, if you really want to get morbid, you can talk about, you know, some animals float when they drown, some animals sink when they drown. You know, so that, that comes into play. And so, so you actually have a very good explanation of the fossil record from the flood. Now, where the flood is, and the biblical account, scripture, again, is scripture reasonable, is superior, is because it explains things like why aren't there any transitional forms? Uh, because if you look at it, there are no transitional forms. Everything that we've you know, said maybe that's a transitional form or, or claim could be a transitional form gets studied for a while, and it turns out it's either uh, a whole different kind of animal or it's just variation within a kind. I mean, I'll give an example of that. The, uh, say, say dogs were extinct. And so all we had were fossil dogs. You know, we had no idea where dogs came from. Well, two reasonable interpretations, and I'll just say that with limited evidence, would be uh, either a beagle is a transitional form between a Yorkie and a German Shepherd, right? Because you think about a beagle, you know, it's, it looks similar, but maybe it's a Yorkie evolving into a German Shepherd. Uh, that could be one interpretation. Or Another interpretation could be no Yorkies and Beagles and German Shepherds are all just variation within a kind. And of course, we know that because they still exist today, that Yorkies and Beagles and German Shepherds are all just variation within a kind. But you think about it, just within dogs, which everybody would agree uh, is a variation within a kind, people, I think, pretty much agree that all the different breeds of dogs we say today could have come from just two original dogs. Um, because of the genetic diversity in those dogs. Uh, but you gotta admit that, boy, they look a lot different. You know, I go, I go even further. You compare the, if you look at the skeleton of Chihuahua compared to the skeleton of a Great Dane and say that, oh no, those are all dogs. I mean, you can see why people might be led astray. Well, we know that, we know what we know because dogs still exist today. But when people are interpreting fossils, uh, they're very open to interpretation. Now, do have some quotes, won't read them, uh, but people readily admitting that it's the theory that dominates how fossils and are interpreted, not the actual evidence. And so the idea is someone finds a fossil today and they know the theory says, well, this turned into this. Well, there's gonna be this pressure to say, oh, that fossil that must be, you know, must be consistent with that theory. Uh, that's one point. Um, and then the other point is, uh, you know, people realize that there aren't transitional forms. And so this, in this case, it was uh, basically an author being pressured to put transitional forms in his book. And these aren't, I mean, this is Colin Patterson. He's a senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. So it's not, these aren't just amateurs. Uh, but he's basically saying, hey, if I knew of any transitional forms, I'd put them in my book. Uh, but he didn't, and he didn't want to just have an artist make something up because in his words, that would mislead the reader. So again, there's, uh, again, I say just a lot of healthy discussion and debate amongst a lot of uh, people that study fossils. Now there's also, you know, unfortunately, like anything else, there's also a lot of notice, you know, conform and, you know, go along with the, whatever the current paradigm happens to be. So I want to give just a, uh, a couple of uh, evidences. This was, uh, I'm going to jump right to, uh, uh, I guess I'll say to humans, uh, just to give an idea of, of what this interpretation can mean. So this is Nebraska man. It lasted from about 1922 to 1927. And you think, well, that's so long ago. Why are we talking about that? Well, 1925 was when there was a Scopes trial. And what the Scopes trial was effectively trying to do was uh, allow or encourage teachers to teach that apes turned into humans, okay? And that was 1925. So this was actually very powerful evidence that was available at the Scopes trial because we knew we had Nebraska man. And so what had happened was uh, they'd found a, a tooth, okay? And so a tooth was found. They sent it off to the uh, um, American Museum of Natural History in New York and that tooth was identified as human, okay? So you have a tooth. Now from that tooth, this was in the Illustrated London News. Um, I hope you can see it, but okay, so we know what Nebraska man looks like. Okay, so that's pretty impressive from a tooth. So there's a picture of Nebraska man. Uh, but we also know what his wife looked like. Okay, everybody see his spouse there? Okay, so now we know Nebraska, one tooth. Uh, Nebraska man is one. We know what kind of weapon he used, okay? Uh, we know what kind of livestock he kept. You see the camels in the background there. So that's uh, yeah, it's just amazing uh, what we can learn from a tooth. Well, 
Of course, the reason it only lasted until 1927, 1927, another fossil tooth was found, but this time there were bones with the tooth. And so Nebraska man, we found out, was just an extinct wild pig, okay? And so that's, I mean, to me, that's funny looking back on it, but boy, I'd hate to be 1925 and be a Christian and saying, no, God created people in his own image and having all these people say, well, you're ignorant. You haven't heard of Nebraska man yet, you know? And then they explained to how, uh, you know, Nebraska man somehow proved apes turned into humans. Again, we know what he looks like, his wife, his weapons, his livestock. We know the whole works. Uh, is all wrong, but you wonder how much effect that could have had during those five years. Now, a lot of other examples of this. This is uh, uh, Archaeoraptor, and this one is still hanging around. They're still saying that uh, maybe dinosaurs turned into birds, and we have tremendous evidence that that didn't happen. But this was a cover story in National Geographic. It only lasted a few months, uh, but what had happened was um, essentially this uh, proof, yes, you know, fossil was found, and what had happened was a body and head of a bird was combined with the tail of a dinosaur. But it wasn't National Geographic and Nature that had done it directly, but what they had done is apparently they offered a tremendous sum of money to anybody that could provide evidence that dinosaurs turned into birds. And so that's a very, very poor way of doing science. And so there were uh, uh, fraudulent fossils that were sold to them. They displayed them. Uh, in the, this one was in the National Geographic Explorers Hall. 110,000 people viewed this. Uh, but again, it was a complete fraud, but made the cover story of National Geographic. They did issue, to their credit, they issued a retraction, but if you know how retractions go, you know, usually you have the cover story, and if they have to retract it two or three months later, that's like, you know, in the kind of the, I can't remember if it's the left or the right lower corner that they put the paragraph in and said, oh, we were wrong about that. Yeah, and so, uh, but that's, um, but the point is, um, this one was, exposed, it was pretty well publicized. This was Storrs Olson, Curator of Birds at the National Museum of Natural History, saying the idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic, who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Okay, so that gets harsher, uh, but that's, uh, that was, so they got pushed back there. It actually even made uh, the cover of USA Today. Uh, cover story. And this one just says, uh, bird fossils hailed as a major find until red-faced scientists discover it was doctored. And so again, it's, uh, um, so at least it got some uh, publicity, I would say. But it's, uh, uh, again, it doesn't always get uh, very well publicized. And so I want to wrap up with just the, uh, well, one of the points on this, we know from true science dinosaurs didn't turn into birds. You can look at all the differences between dinosaurs and birds. And this particular slide, just looking at this idea that a scale could turn into a feather, uh, scales are folds of skin. You know, feathers are incredibly sophisticated. If you look at like a flight feather, it has barbs and barbules, hooks, all kinds of things to make the flight feather function. So where did that information come from? Uh, but it's even different proteins that make a scale and a feather. And so again, just from studying true science, we know dinosaurs didn't turn into birds. And there's everything from the respiratory system, all kinds of differences. Uh, so that could have been used to explain that. But I want to uh, wrap up a lot of other examples that could be given. But I want to just uh, finish up with uh, what we call uh, Lucy, OK? So anyone hear of Lucy ever? OK, so this is this Australopithecine, which is supposedly uh, showing that apes turned into humans. And so uh, this is a, uh, some quotes. This is about 15 years ago. What the person writing this, he was the um, uh, he was the associate professor of anatomy and neurobiology at Washington University. Okay, so very, again, very qualified. And he's pointing out that that foot, which is on a Lucy statue, or was at that point, uh, looks absolutely nothing at all like the fossil evidence. And he's just saying, you know, usually, you know, that you have a lot of artistic license with fossils, but he's saying usually they don't just completely misrepresent the fossils. And that's what they were doing. Uh, so it goes on, you know, says, uh, be clear if they, if they did an accurate representation of Lucy, that it just looked like a tree-dwelling primate. This was a zoo exhibit. Um, now, this is a very disturbing quote to me. At the bottom, it says, uh, Bruce Carr, the zoo's director of education, has no plans to alter the exhibit. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence, he says. What we look at is the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think that the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. Well, what's the impression he's trying to create? Well, that apes turned into humans. And, and so it, it, you know, basically admitting that uh, the exhibit's wrong, 
Um, they know it's wrong, but they're not going to change it because the impression, apparently, that's wanting to be created is that apes turned into humans. So this is when we start wondering, you know, why is this person so resistant to the Bible? Why won't this person consider that God created people in his own image? Well, again, what, 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 peop, what age people, well, I love zoos still, so I can't say what age people, but you know, kids love zoos, okay? Kids love museums. If someone's taught something when they're four or five years old, they may or may not, they just know it. You know, they might, when by the time they're 25, they might have no idea how they know it. They just know it. And so that can be very hard to overcome this. So uh, this is a, a more accurate representation of Lucy, uh, again. And it says, uh, points out if Lucy's feet were accurately shown, it would be obvious they could never fit into the famous Laetoli fossil footprints. Uh, and again, it just, you know, it's a really neat looking uh, extinct ape. But what I want to uh, follow up on is, okay, so you think, well, that was probably 10, 15 years ago. Well, what do we see today? Well, this is uh, right now, uh, it's been a, a little over a year since I was there, but this is the uh, Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And they have this huge, uh, couple hundred million dollar, probably exhibit dedicated to evolution. You know, and it's very subtle. You know, it tries to be very convincing, but um, you know, as mentioned by Dr. Minton, you know, hip bones had to be altered to make it fit into a human. But uh, if you read carefully what they say, so this is, this is one of the displays in other words, the hip bones uh, would basically be consistent with an eight, you know, knuckle walker, uh, and uh, they had to alter them to make it look like Lucy could uh, walk upright. And so that's one change. But it says the brown bones are casts of the parts of Lucy's skeleton that were ex excavated. So you notice there's a few brown bones, but there's a lot of black. It says the black bones represent missing parts. They were filled in using mirror images of bones that were found, fossils from other individuals of Lucy's species, and knowledge of human anatomy. Okay, so what are they assuming? Well, they're, they're already assuming that uh, Lucy, you know, the Australopithecines turned into a human. I mean, what if I was uh, trying to recreate a rabbit fossil and I'm putting the rabbit fossil together and I only had like 10 bones, but I knew human anatomy. You know, am I gonna come up with the right rabbit fossil? Yeah. It could look really weird, but no. Yeah, I mean, so that's, uh, so you get uh, things like that. But this, okay, so this is, you know, they're admitting we didn't find too many bones. Uh, you can have little things, a lot of people point out, well, usually the black, is what you find and the brown is what's missing. They flipped it, so there's actually a lot less if, if someone goes in with that mindset. Uh, but anyway, a lot of things in that particular exhibit. Um, you know, and then it uh, you know, talks about uh, toe bones being different, uh, but the actual toe bones you know, in an Australopithecine, they're actually longer and more curved, uh, apparently, than are in this particular uh, fossil that's on exhibit. But again, you can still say, at least they're admitting that the, the feet are different. You know, so humans have different feet. Um, but then, it's, uh, then it gets kind of worse. Okay, so now uh, the toes, yeah, as you move through the exhibit, the toes start getting more human, uh, but you start looking at the artistic impression. So that's almost starting to be like a human expression on the face. Uh, and so they, uh, you know, spotlight on the foot, altered to look human, and then starting to have human facial expressions. Um, then it gets even worse. Okay, so you notice, okay, here's the parallel between the, the ape and the human. Uh, you know, the human's thinking, the ape's thinking. Uh, and I wish, uh, um, yeah, hopefully you can see this, but if you look at the, uh, this is a depiction, I mean, it's just a picture of the actual exhibit. I mean, that just looks like a, a funny looking human uh, with this very human expression. It's like uh, he or she is just looking over and saying, oh, hey, Fred, how's it going? You know, and, it's, uh, and so that's, again, just the uh, impression that they try to make. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, so anyway, it's, uh, it's just, again, it's just this gradual transition uh, from, uh, uh, from something that looks if, if the bones are accurately depicted, essentially it would look like that. Okay, so you get from, that's what an Australopithecine most likely looks like. We don't know for sure, because again, there's, it's just fossil evidence. All the way to uh, walking down the beach, you know, talking to friends on the other side or walking down, you know, or walking across some ash or something. So, uh, uh, and again, just want to point out, this was a, uh, a weekday in November, I think. And, uh, you yeah, know, just a casual, that whole evolution exhibit, all kinds of kids, all kinds of you know, good families. You know, they're wanting to do stuff with their kids. So again, that's what makes this tough. It's not criticizing anybody, but just being, uh, just being brainwashed the whole time. And so that's what uh, you know, essentially we're going to be up against. So again, keep the goal in mind, Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. Uh, As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, by speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects to him who is head, even Christ. And then... Uh, bottom line is, again, what we're getting at is uh, having a person realize that they need to take the Bible seriously. They need to take their eternity 
uh, seriously, and that's where all of us should focus in all situations. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, went through kind of fast. Uh, any, any, any questions or comments related to the fossil record, uh, Lucy, the flood? Uh, just wanted to get enough stuff out there. If, if someone gets into this, there's so much good information out there uh, that you can, uh, you can really use this to evangelize. And so don't be, uh, uh, encourage them to get into deeper into the true science behind this. Because if they get into the true science, they'll realize it's completely consistent with the Bible and it's going to contradict a lot of what they might have heard. Uh, any, any final uh, questions or comments? All right, so the good news, bad news is like, you know, I can't, there's no clock in here, but I, I imagine we're getting close. So uh, anyway, thanks uh, uh, again. If you, uh, uh, if you yeah, sign up for some books last week, they should be on the table, that one to the left near the door. And uh, if you've seen the other books that you might be interested, please sign up for those too. So, all right, well, have a, have a, have a blessed evening. Thanks.